Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm Jane Goodman, Public Health Strategist with the National Division of Public Health and Community Services. Today, I'm joined by Jessica Gorin of the Greater Nashua Food Council. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, Jane. Thanks for having me today. Well, I'm so happy you could come and talk to us about um, the Greater Nashua Food Council. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, how it started. I know that you are, you are the founder. Co-founder. Um, Co-founder. Co-founder, so, okay. yeah. <laughs> so just give me a little history about it. Yeah, so the Greater Nashua Food Council um, was kind of a um, idea that came out of the Farm to School program. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Monroe is one of the Farm to School coordinators who was working closely with Andrew Morin from Regenerative Roots and Stacy Persolo, who is the New Hampshire Farm to School coordinator at UNH Sustainability Institute, mm -hmm. um, had all talked about the next step of the Farm to School program being to start a food council. So Justin brought together, he's a natural collaborator. He's so mm -hmm. good at doing that. So through his work with Grow Nashua and his role as the farm to school coordinator, he brought together a bunch of community organizations into a room and said, um, hey, what do you think? Should we form a food council? We mm -hmm. could be the first one in the state and we could do a lot of good things and start coordinating our efforts and have a bigger impact. And everybody that was at that meeting, I would say probably about like 15 to 20 organizations, including the public health department. Mm -hmm. And actually I was wearing my program assistant hat at that time for mm -hmm. the public health department. And um, we started talking about strategy and like, how do, we, how do we get this started? So Justin and I sat down together and we started putting together plans to start a food council um, and had lots of support from Stacy at the farm to school. Um, for <laughs> the New Hampshire Farm to School program. Yeah. Sorry. No, and that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of, oh, always a lot of acronyms in exactly. public health. <laughs> it's, it's so true. Um, and there's a lot of collaborators. And that's one thing that, you know, so gr the Greater National Food Council is a collective impact or a mm -hmm. collaborative organization. So it is its own organization. It's a program of the Nashua Soup Kitchen and Shelter. Okay. Um, they are the fiscal sponsor for the Greater Nashua Food Council. Okay. So they were the ones that gave us our first round of funding to get started. And Justin and I sat down and said, okay, how can we get people together? We had a first meeting where we brainstormed with about 25 to 30 different organizations in Nashua. And everybody started putting down, like, I think I gave you a list of all the things we've done. Those mm. were on that initial list of mm. things like, what do we want to do to improve food access and nutrition education in the greater Nashua region? Um, so that was And when did that start? August of 2017. Okay, so it's been about, oh, not quite four years, not three quite and a half years. years. Yeah. And you've really taken off because I've seen your stuff around the city. Um, you have a lot of, um, well, let's back up. Tell me about the problem of hunger in Nashua if possible. I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, but, you know, people don't always realize, like, what a problem it is, even in our own city. Yeah, so um, we know that 13% of our population in Nashua is under under the poverty level, mm -hmm. and that we have five um, Title I schools, which means that over 41% of those schools, um, oh, so Title I elementary schools, I mm -hmm. should specify that's elementary schools, um, that they have high rates of free and reduced um, school lunch school yeah. lunch participation. So because of those high rates, um, it really shows how vulnerable parts of Nashua are around poverty and hunger. Mm -hmm. um, we know that when people are also don't qualify for SNAP, EBT, or school meals, that they often are the ones that are going hungry because they're choosing whether or not to pay for their rent, their electricity bill, mm or to buy groceries and put groceries on the table. So we know that that's a, that, that can be a problem in Nashua. And I feel like the Food Council's partners have done a really good job at identifying this mm -hmm. and really putting together some great programs in order to do a lot of no questions asked food distribution mm -hmm. to make sure people are getting access. And a lot of times it's local food too. Um, so as local, as local as we can get it to be mm -hmm. able to distribute local produce in communities. Yeah, that's amazing because you don't really, so that's five Title I schools out of, I think, how many elementary schools? I think there's seven? Seven. Yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty significant to think that there are that many kids that are food insecure in our city. And um, I always hearken back to, like, if you can't eat a good meal in the morning or you, you can't focus in school, you can't behave if you're distracted by hunger. So to me, hunger, food insecurity, 
it's just a basic issue that we have to work on and we have to work on as a community, as you said. Um, tell me about some of your partners. I mean, you have, I, the list is huge. <laughs> yes, we have so many partners. Um, so our two major funders mm -hmm. are Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation and Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. um, we also work really closely with United Way, Nashua Soup Kitchen and Shelter, Grow Nashua, Salvation Army, the Nashua School District, the YMCA, um, the Public Health Department, um, Boys and Girls Club of Greater Nashua, or of Nashua, um, I'm just trying to think. I don't want to leave anybody uh, out. From but, your list here, I see. Yeah. Uh, you're Anifers, doing pretty well. We do pretty well. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of really great partners. And the really great thing about all of these partners um, is they have built these relationships over the last three years. So when COVID happened um, and those stay-at-home orders happened so quickly, everybody turned on a dime to make sure school meals were distributed out to families. Mm -hmm. So um, Mike from the United Way led the charge. And he got everybody together on a call. And by the end of the call, they had a distribution plan. They were new, you know, all the school locations where food would be distributed, times, days, and- And didn't things go on buses too? And then things- the then he, weren't going Yeah, to then he reached out to the Nashua Transit s System and then we had food going out on buses. So at one point we had 10 school sites and 16 bus stops. And so for a total of 26 locations mm. and on Fridays, at all of those locations, we had fresh produce through our mobile produce pantry program. Nice. If you can say that 10 times. I know, fast. I was gonna say, <laughs> good luck with that one. But tell me about that, because what I, I know a little bit about Grow Nashua um, and the food that they do grow right in the city. You see it uh, near the bank, you see it downtown. It's really amazing. But tell me about the local produce and where you're getting that from, because there's some interesting things here on how you're sourcing that. Yeah, so no like real, it's a, it's a big answer, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> that's okay, we got time. Okay, so the way the mobile produce pantry, it was piloted in 2019 and we picked five neighborhoods and we ran it for five weeks and we were able to distribute, I think we had around um, maybe 7,000 pounds, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, uh, that we distributed during those five weeks mm. last, in the summer of um, 2019. When COVID happened, we had all of those school sites that we were starting to distribute produce to. Plus we started with eight community locations and expanded that to 10. So at one point in time, we had a total of 36 community locations where fresh produce was being wow. distributed. And that was all being coordinated by the United Way and the Nashua Soup Kitchen and Shelter. Um, and then we had volunteers from the Boys and Girls Club and from the YMCA to help with this distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so the fresh produce gets sourced from the New Hampshire Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And they have a New Hampshire's Feeding New Hampshire program. So they're raising funds to buy local produce from farmers. They also are the recipient of all the glean produce in the state. Mm. That also goes to individual pantries. So don't think they get it all, all, but they do get a large amount. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know weekly when I was, did a ride along with one of the gleaners from Hillsborough County, we dropped off 1,600 um, pounds of produce in one mm. in one visit. I so, love that idea that they glean yeah. the fields. I, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that. So if you could just describe it, because I just, it's really fascinating because it really also eliminates waste as well. So just a quick description of it, you yeah, know, what so it means. Not all, veg not all produce is pretty. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it can't be sold on the retail market and it, or that it's over, you know, there's overgrowth and it doesn't have a, a customer to go to. Mm -hmm. So the farmers, a lot of times themselves will glean the produce after they'll pick it. They'll pick mm -hmm. the stuff that they're not going to sell and they'll put it in boxes. And then we have gleaners who are people that go and they pick up that fresh produce mm -hmm. and then take it and distribute it through the community to food pantries, to the food bank, and um, sometimes to like housing centers um, where people are in need. Now there is other types of gleaning. There's the type of gleaning where a farmer calls the gleaning coordinator and says, hey, we have a whole row of cucumbers. That's what I'm thinking yeah. of. <laughs> <laughs> so that happens too. Unfortunately, things get complicated with liabilities and insurances. Mm -hmm. So it does happen both ways, but the way that we do most of it is that the farmers kind of pick it on their own um, as they're picking everything else and then our gleaners pick it up. Mm. But um, sometimes it's eggs, sometimes it's meat, you know, um, it's, it's not always fresh produce, but at our produce pantries, that's 
really what we're making sure is that mm -hmm. fresh food is getting out to the community. And that seems like it's such an important complement to the other food that's going out. So a few weeks back, we talked to Jen Morton from N68, and you know she made the point that they they have to do all non-perishable. So they're doing a lot of cans and you know stuff that will fill up kids over the weekend. Um, but having that fresh produce supplement that, I think, is really critical because you get a little bit more nutrition. Yeah. And um, you know into their diets, into diets. Absolutely, yeah, it is so important. And, and we know that in our highest vulnerable communities that they have the highest rate of chronic disease like type two diabetes and heart disease. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, precursors to that are obesity. And so obesity in children leads to type two diet, early type two diabetes diagnoses or mm -hmm. heart disease, onset yeah. in adulthood. And um, we also know that through our you know, through the community health improvement, mm -hmm. you know, plans and the community health assessments that you do at the public health department that, um, you know, in those populations, about 10% of families don't have access to health care at all. Mm -hmm. So if we can help with prevention and making sure families have access to good, healthy food, we know that we're helping to give them a better quality of life and the food that they want to have at home, mm -hmm. and then also helping to reduce the overall health care costs of our community. Mm -hmm. So... so Win-win. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is totally a win-win. So that being said, you made me think of something else. Of course, now it's just flown right out of my head. Um, oh, yeah. So I think of produce, and I spent some time overseas a million years ago as a Peace Corps volunteer, and there were a lot of new crops being introduced. So I was thinking kind of like a lot of people really didn't even know how to eat the crops. Like they didn't know what to do with a pineapple, for example. Now again, this is many, many years ago. But then we think about our refugee and our immigrant community in this area, and they may or may not recognize some of the things that we eat locally or that we grow. So I noticed you had cooking classes. So we, tell me about, that was my segue. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so I kind of have like, three different answers for that, that okay. question. So I'll start off with the cooking classes. So Grow Nashua in, in Justin's wisdom, he could see that that was going to be an issue that people would be um, new Americans here and not really familiar with the types of foods that could be grown here and wouldn't know how to cook them. So when he started Grow Nashua, he was also partnered with the Cooking Matters project mm -hmm. through the New Hampshire Food Bank. Oh, right. And for all of the families that would sign up for his community garden, which his community gardens, he started as a social project so that people could have an opportunity to socialize with each other over growing food mm. versus growing food and then socializing second. It was mm -hmm. socialize first and grow food second. Mm. And there was a lot of great um, teaching practices about you know, how, if different irrigation systems in different countries, because as new Americans came here, they were teaching us like different gardening practice and teaching each other like what would mm. work. and. It was really great because um, there's a lot of social isolation that goes on with our refugee and new American populations as they have some culture shock coming into the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so his program was huge in that way. And then the cooking classes gave them a way to receive a $10 gift card from Hannaford's for everybody that participates. Mm -hmm. um, so they were getting free groceries when they would come. And then they would also get the ingredients they needed to cook their meals and take them home. Nice. Um, and they, they would learn a little bit about what they were cooking. They would learn how to cook what they were growing in their gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and they have even done one of their cooking matters completely in Spanish. So they're working on really making, um, reducing the language barriers too, mm -hmm. as much as possible. Which is a huge need in the Nashville community. You know, we we can't do much work at public health without our translators. and and others because um, there is a lot of a lot of different languages spoken in our community and you know it's something that people really need to understand to reach you know this I love that you say new Americans I'm gonna start using that term it's really it's much better than immigrant or you know so I, I appreciate that new vocabulary from you as well oh, thanks. so what um, besides the cooking matters are there other um, cooking preparation programs or nutrition so classes there's, or there's other other ways to also take away the forwardness of the food that they're that are that's being offered um, so one is that through our work with the um, New Hampshire COVID-19 equity task force through mm -hmm. the New Hampshire Public Health Association um, we recognized that pantries were serving 
you know, mostly Americanized foods. Um, mm -hmm. And so we created a cultural grocery list, shopping list for pantries to give out to their donors or to put out when they're doing food drives. And that way that would help to ensure that pantries were getting more culturally appropriate items in their pantry. Oh. So that was um, something that we, you know, didn't realize needed some assistance and we were able to like provide that document and do the research and we worked with the the COVID equity um, task force is broken down into like multiple like other groups. So mm -hmm. we worked with the um, immigration group and some of the other partners to really come up with a comprehensive list that was really included all cultures mm -hmm. and foods from all cultures so that there was a list. And honestly, if anybody's looking to donate to a pantry, the best thing that they can do is give a gift card if they want to make sure that mm. items are culturally appropriate um, because families will use them on food. That's, you know, they need that food to feed their families. And if they can go out and buy what they need and what works for their culture and what helps them to feed their family in the way that they're used to, um, that's even more beneficial. Mm -hmm. I used to, um, on a little sidebar note, I used to work, be a part of the Friends program and the my, my junior friend that I worked with was from Zambia. And I remember her saying when she first came to the United States, she would get so sick from eating the school lunches because her body wasn't used to eating Absolutely. those certain foods. And so being able to provide families, um, new American families or refugee families with a gift card to buy what they need um, and what will feel good when they eat it is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but I did want to touch on one more part before absolutely. we change directions. No. So while we're talking about um, culturally appropriate foods, um, Fresh Start Farms is one of our organizational partners at the Food Council, mm -hmm. and they are part of the Organization for Refugee and Immigrant Success, and all of, most of their farmers are from African countries, mm. and so they grow a lot of African foods. So I just happen to be a farm share member for them, and I learned how to cook with amaranth last year, okay. which was really, really exciting. Have you figured out how to peel plantains? Um, no. Did you I, get those yet? I haven't gotten plantain yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're very hard to peel. Yeah. And they're very sticky. So that's, again, my 30-year-old knowledge about plantains. So I kind of shy away from them for that reason, but I'd love to learn. Yeah. And so what they do is they include recipes in their box mm -hmm. that tells you how to use something that might not be um, common for um, us in our Western culture. Right. Um, so they also include recipes for us to use and, how, and, and dishes to make and um, using the ingredients that the farmers are growing. And I will just say that as a little plug for them, they have their um, summer shares are being sold. They offer a bi-weekly. You get to kind of pick what's in your box so you mm. don't get just a standard share. It's really affordable. It's $28 a week. And if you have SNAP and EBT, um, they have the Granite State Market Match program. So 50% of that cost is covered through the Granite State Market Match program. Oh, that's amazing. Making a $28 box, $14. Yeah, and, and for, I know that they can use their EBT benefits also at, at the farmer's markets. Yes, exactly. So, and that's run by one of our partners, Great American Downtown. Great segue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can go to the farmer's markets on Sunday and you can also use that same program and they'll give you tokens to go shop. You, you swipe there first, they give you tokens to go shop. And for every dollar you spend on produce, you get another dollar you can spend any way you want to at the farmer's market. Yeah, which is great. Right. So it doubles your money. So, And for the Granite State Market Match program, there is no cap. So um, other programs have a cap on how much you spend. But if you spend $40 in your food, in your like SNAP and EBT money, you get $40 to spend mm -hmm. at the farmer's market. So it doubles your dollars for sure. Wow, that's great. That's that's so important to give that access and to make it easier because fresh fresh produce is more expensive than some of the canned and processed food. So Yeah, absolutely. So through the Food Council right now, there's ways to go to mobile produce pantries and grab produce for free. Um, and we'll be posting th those new sites on our website so you can know where to go in the community. There'll be three school sites and seven community sites where you can go and grab fresh produce um, certain days of the week and at, cer and at certain times. It's, oh, it's like always Monday through Friday. It's always from 11 to 1230, but the sites mm -hmm. are, you know, are different each day. Right. Um, so we'll be sending that out. And through that program, Little Free Farm Stand, which is through a Grow Nashville program using the same model, but they're doing kind of a Neighbors Feeding Neighbors program. So they're asking community members who would like to donate food from their garden 
to sign up mm. through Grow Nashua's pro Little Free Farm Stand program, and then they'll coordinate that to get out on, into these um, really nice wooden structures that are these little farm stands where people can grab fresh produce. And that came from some funding we got from Dartmouth Hitchcock. Mm. Um, they were seeing the work we were doing around coordinating food resources, and they said, we want to be a part of that. So they gave us some funding to do several projects, and Little Free Farm Stand was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so now not only do we have the mobile produce pantries being put out by the United Way and the soup kitchen, but now we also have three new Little Free Farm Stands going out around town that, wow. through Grow Nashua. You guys are busy. Yeah. <laughs> And not to mention that the Salvation Army has taken this model, too, and run with it. And some of their volunteers will just do pop-up pantries in communities. Wow. So there's a lot of um, access now in Nashua. And it really is the collaboration, right? So it all started from this one model mm -hmm. that we ran as a pilot. Where we got funding from Harvard Pilgrim to do this model. And that model exploded. Mm -hmm. And we know through our produce pantries last summer that we had um, up to 36 sites. We served over 8,000 people. 35,000 pounds of produce. Wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of truckloads. That's a carrots. lot of truckloads of carrots. <laughs> <laughs> and cabbage, hopefully, and too, cabbage, take hopefully. up some of the weight. Yeah. Um, but wow, that's incredible. And it's so, again, it's just so important to meet those needs, and especially during COVID. Right. Like you had said, you know, people are isolated. They don't want to go to the grocery store. Or they're nervous about it, or they may not have their jobs because they've lost employment. So, um, you know, having that access to that food and it seems like, and you're in so many places, you know, the the different, the 36 sites, which really makes it more accessible to to really everybody that yeah, needs it. Yeah, exactly. And being in, you know, places where you can just be walkable yeah, is really important. So, um, so all of our talk about SNAP and EBT mm -hmm. is a good transition. Okay, take it. Okay. So um, our... Our idea this year, right, it was, we know we need more community engagement. So we feel like all the partners are doing such a great job communicating with each other to serve the community. We have got that under control with our food council work. Now, how do we engage the community a mm -hmm. little bit more around the work? I mean, as we both know in public health, it's really important to have community voices and developing community programs to make sure that they work. Um, so we needed some things though to, what do we engage the community on? Well, it's SNAP and EBT applications and um, free and reduced meal applications mm -hmm. along with participation in school meals. Mm -hmm. So these, we're working on this with New Hampshire Hunger Solutions and the Fair Food Network, as well as our other, and um, Kelly Creative is mm -hmm. helping us do oh, our marketing. Shoshana, yeah. Yep, so Sean is helping us do our marketing. So we're all working together to create a campaign. So you'll see us now at the bus transit um, center um, right behind the um, city hall. Okay. We have... Um, we had that billboard at one point. Yep, but. so now we have that billboard. <laughs> I'll have to go look. <laughs> and then we have um, signage on the buses mm -hmm. that are leading people to that. That's, we have a greaternashuafoodcouncil.org forward slash easy. Mm -hmm. And that will bring you to signing up for SNAP and EBT as well as being able to sign up for free and reduced meals for right. schools. And we know that... that Having those access to those programs is so important because it feeds so many families. Mm -hmm. But also during the pandemic, we also know that there's pandemic EBT. So unfortunately with the confusion that we had mm -hmm. in our state around um, some schools going back in full and some being alternate day models and some being completely at home, we weren't able to draw down the funds um, from January to present. But if families go and sign up for SNAP and EBT, mm -hmm and also sign up for free and reduced meals. And they will auto qualify. It just takes time to auto qualify from SNAP to the school meals. Okay. But if they do those two things, what will happen is when we're able to pull down those funds for the summer, they will be retroactively paid on their SNAP cards from October 2020. So from October 1st, 2020, their SNAP and EBT cards will be loaded with $5.85 a day per child per day oh. for the days that they were not in school. So gotcha. it has that, that not in school is very important. So it doesn't mean it'll be all five days. If they were hybrid and they were in school two days a week, mm -hmm. they'll get that for three days a week. So, so it took a little thinking about how this was gonna work. Yeah, administratively on the back end, yeah. it's confusing. We won't spend time talking about right, that. Right. But we just want families to know how important it is to, to, sign, up? to sign up. And I really just put a marker out there. I mean, the numbers are very specific. But if 
you're a family of five or six and you're making your household income is under sixty thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. you should be signing up. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And going and going online and signing up. And so there's assistance programs. Um, NewHampshireEasy.com is for SNAP and EBT. And there's a phone number there. Jennifer at the New Hampshire Food Bank is great. She'll help you fill out your application. Mm -hmm. And you can fill these out at any time, right? There's no like enrollment period? There or? is, but oh, with okay. COVID times that was lifted. So we have okay. until June 15th to get your applications in to help you out for the following school, like for the rest for of the school fall. year and this for the fall and to make sure you get your pandemic EBT dollars. Okay. June 15th. Well, I'll get that in the newsletter for next week. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so, it's super, so we super make sure that important. agencies know that they should be helping uh, assist with this and that it's just another source. But I mean, how great would that be to all of a sudden get your card filled right? and really be able to use those benefits, you know, into the fall? Ex exactly, exactly. You be know, able to start the school year off right, good nutritious food. You can go to the grocery store. You know, obviously EBT is not just for the farm stands. So. And in New Hampshire, we leave so much money on the table. So please do not leave the money on the table. Right. Apply for it, get the money. We have it. We've been approved that funding. So That's we great. should absolutely use it. Um, so, and I, yeah, go ahead. I know we only have a, a few minutes left. So I just want to say like that is, you know, that's super important. But for families who don't qualify for free and reduced meals, right now meals are universal. Mm -hmm. So the more people that participate, the more it supports our school meal programs and make sure that those school meal programs can run and function for the kids who do need it. Mm -hmm. So even if your children don't need it, they should definitely be participating. It really makes it easier for um, oh, you because at Because it's home. free for everybody right Because it's now. free for everybody and yes. the school gets reimbursed for every meal sent out. So the more participation, the better the school meal yeah. program can be. Yeah. I I wasn't following it first, but I am now. Yes. Because okay. my kids do get the free lunch and I'm like, well, we don't need that, but we're happy to, you know, they do actually eat it. So <laughs> that's great. And that by doing that, they're helping a family who does need it. Yeah. So, so great. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about the food council and the amazing work that is happening across the city with so many partners. Um, it's just really a pleasure. I mean, that's like the um, whole gestalt of public health is that community partnership and working together. We and leaving, like, leaving no food on the table, that's wasted. And so that's really important because um, we do have the resources in the community. We just have to get them in the right hands. So, so thank you. Oh, thank you, Jane. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Take care. You too. And thank you for joining us on Public Health Matters. Just a reminder, we do have a COVID testing clinic every Tuesdays from 3 to 4.30. We've moved back to the Elm Street parking garage. You can make an appointment online or call our hotline at 589-3456. Have a great day.